Welcome everybody to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference brought to you in partnership with the Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Our next session is going to be ZDR3, Specialized Disaster Response for Organizations Housing Exotic Animals with a focus on human safety and animal welfare. This is going to be Julia Wagner from ZDR3 in the USA. It is our privilege to have her speak today. All bios and abstracts are available to read from our website under speakers. Before we start, we've got a little basic housekeeping. First of all, the Zoom chat feature has been disabled. So if you have questions, we encourage questions, but please use the Q&A feature. We will endeavor to answer these near the end of the presentation. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captions. So if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, you can click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We encourage you to use hashtag GADMCONF for Twitter and other social media. A short evaluation will be made available when you exit the sessions. And just a reminder, video recording will not be available until it's been edited, changed into several languages and released later this year. So without further delay, Julia. Thank you. I look forward to speaking with you today about considerations associated with non-domesticated species in disaster. Um, there is more content in this slide deck than I'll be speaking to today, but for those who view the recorded session, it means that you'll be able to see that content. A quick overview of disaster in the United States. We have a very wide geographic scope that we consider when we are looking at a nationwide network of peer-to-peer -peer support. And within the geographic context of the United States, we're looking at a variety of different disasters. These were the billion dollar or plus disasters that we experienced in 2022, um, several of which ZDR3 did engage in response operations as facilities requested support. The exotic animal industry, which encompasses zoos, aquariums, sanctuaries, um, businesses that are holding non-domesticated species and conducting industry with them, uh, they are impacted by a very wide range of disasters that also impact human and domesticated species. So outlined here are some of the considerations that the zoo and aquarium industry really needs to look toward in 2023 related to specific disaster types and the impacts that we can expect to see within the context of our industry. Some of these are areas that ZDR3 directly addresses. Some of them like disease are more for awareness for facilities and considering what areas they're focusing on with their preparedness and response planning. So when we talk about the United States exotic animal industry, there's a lot of, um, I'd say, opinions and probably misperceptions, and now is not the right time to get into all of that. Uh, from a purely demographic standpoint, the map that you're looking at, that represents a portion of the industry for which we provide service on a uh, basis of memorandum of understanding. So these are all of the businesses that we may consider um, being part of the network. We divide our network along FEMA region lines in order to ensure interoperability where necessary. And this gives you an idea that the industry itself is not um, cleanly distributed geographically. There are thousands of relevant businesses. These are only the ones for whom exhibition is a substantial part of their business structure. These businesses cover a variety of different ownership types that can include government engagement. And you're also looking at businesses that fall in certain accrediting groups or have different networks amongst themselves. It's a very um, heterogeneous industry to work with and the species themselves are unique and complex. So the mission of ZDR3 is to provide support um, to these different businesses before, during and after significant incidences. Um, we will respond only uh, when there's a specific request made by the facility and these responses are conducted regardless of the facility's affiliations, and we are incorporated as a 501c3 nonprofit. Currently, our network encompasses over 140 um, facilities that hold a memorandum of understanding. This is encompassing at this point 32 states and territories and all FEMA regions. Uh, and the chart shows the number of MOU holders who joined each year. So we had substantial uptick in 2021. 
which aligned with our growth patterns. Um, ZDR3 actually began getting conceptualized several years ago uh, after Hurricane Harvey impacted the Texas region and substantial response needs were required without a centralized mechanism there. And so what ensued in the following years was the conceptualization and development of ZDR3. We launched in 2020 and really pushed forward into the industry in 2021, working on growing the network. And throughout the intervening years, we've been conducting response operations uh, in multiple geographies as the need has both risen um, with the large scale instances we're seeing impacting uh, different geographies, such as the Gulf Coast. Um, we're seeing a lot of impact to Florida at this point, but also as our network and the understanding of what we can do has grown, so have those requests for support. ZDR3 was incepted out of a need. Um, there are many um, wonderful groups engaging in work uh, related to domestic animals, large animals, but when it comes to exotic animals, you're looking at specialized needs and specialized resource requirements. Um, few facilities are able to independently create or maintain a network, so we really determined that this needed to be a staffed endeavor. In addition, um, we have found that facilities that have experienced a significant disaster, they're often overwhelmed by the immediate needs that they're facing. And those facilities that have a reliance on outside support, such as contractors, are especially vulnerable to things like not being able to address their own debris removal considerations after a windstorm. Oftentimes, peer facilities are willing and eager to help. But if you don't have a more coordinated structure than knowing who to call, if you haven't established resources, you have an established memorandum of understanding and ways of working, you very quickly have an uncontrolled incident. And so we needed a way to really connect that peer-to-peer -peer aid in a way that um, was conducive to the principles of emergency management. We also are finding that these large incidences required large scale coordination and potentially teams coming in from larger geographies because the immediate area was so compromised that the local facilities were not able to render immediate support to their uh, neighbors essentially. And by building this network, we are able to do kind of that upfront work that helps the industry then turn around and support their peers um, in a tradition that's always existed. We're just able to help uh, formalize those communications lines and those resource lines. So things that are important to understand, we facilitate and coordinate deployment and provide ongoing support for response teams. Those teams are fielded by facilities within the network. We are not incident commanders at the location that we are serving. The facility that is impacted, they are in charge of their own property, and we help facilitate the work those teams are conducting on their site. We emphasize um, that training and safety are critical for our responders, and the health and welfare of the collection animals need to be top of mind. From a public policy and law standpoint, in the United States, we've had multiple federal um, statutes and regulatory rules come through that do impact animals in disaster. Um, Katrina was the watershed moment in this country for animal and disaster thought process, and that resulted in the Pets Act, which did not specifically identify exotic animals as part of the considered um, framework, but the resulting emphasis on animals has resulted in more uh, attention paid to zoos and their associated needs. We recently had a contingency plan rule requirement passed through the United States Department of Agriculture uh, rulemaking process, which requires contingency planning for licensed exhibitors and other entities. And so much of the zoo and aquarium industry now does have that requirement. And a, re a recent FEMA a requirement that they should have a working group to look at how animal resources are typed is going to further emphasize animal considerations in disaster planning. ZDR3 is a mutual aid network. Mutual aid and mutual aid networks are an essential part of disaster planning in the United States and how the federal government is able to um, amplify their resources in a, in a way that is conducive to the needs at the community level. So ZDR3 is unique in many ways. Our responders are employees at different zoological facilities, meaning they have specialized on the job training and it, it's an understanding of how to function on a site appropriately. And then that added layer of complexity of when it is also compromised. Um, our industry is a closed culture. There's a sensitivity to outsiders. And so having folks come onto a property who do not have prior knowledge of how to operate in a zoological environment is simply not ideal. And this also helps address liability considerations. And that's something that um, the MOU uh, is, incorporates. 
the services we provide are specialized. Um, we do know some of our MOU holders well, others we don't know as well, or they onboard as an incident is occurring. And so we have the challenge of making sure that we understand who they are and in conjunction with helping respond to their situation. Um, we do a lot of weather mapping to understand what types of impacts we may see at facilities within and outside our network. And we have a 24 seven emergency call line. Much of our work actually involves things like debris removal, um, electrical restoration, other types of facilities and operations considerations. However, we do engage in animal work as needed, such as relocations. Um, to the extent possible, the actual care of the animals is ideally met by the animal care staff at the impacted institution. So our goal is as much as possible to ensure that staff is able to stay in place and function while we basically augment and work around them uh, while they're caring for their animals. Because we are dealing with the, the type of species that we are, um, we need to consider the fact that we have potentially large consequences if there are errors, so our folks have to be cognizant of their operating environment. We also have very unique resource considerations that are not generally typed within the main system. So we've had to do a lot of work to understand what our unique resource requirements are for the operating environment we're in. And we also have a negligible chance of reimbursement through any channels. So when the teams go out, it is the facility that is responding that is paying the bill. Um, the impacted institution is not handed a check at the end of the job. The zoo industry is an interesting operating environment and an industry environment that really is conducive to peer-to-peer -peer support because we have this um, incredibly interconnected industry that can lead to challenges, political discord, and really having to understand the culture in order to provide the support that's needed. And the industry is not always as socialized as we would like it to be on things like the emergency management system and how we best fit in. And so that's something that we work to help uh, enhance everyone's understanding of. And it's a challenging external environment. There's a lot of focus on zoos. And so when there's something adverse that occurs at a zoo, there's often going to be a media conversation. There's going to be public interest. And so our operations, we really have to consider discretion, um, ensuring that we are not damaging the facility who we are helping and that we are being responsible industry participants and considering all of the parameters, including regulatory and legal considerations. When you are doing any sort of disaster response, human safety must be a primary consideration. So we do conduct risks and needs assessments. Um, we try to get that over the phone as we're able and as that can be provided and where possible, we send in an initial evaluator to look at the situation and to assess it for incoming responder safety. Uh, this chart shows some of the things that we have to think about at a given site and really look at where the hazards are and how best to mitigate and ensure safety along the way. You have to be very mindful when you're on scene of your own safety and the fact that not everyone on the scene is necessarily thinking about safety as their primary consideration and you can't trust that other folks are not are uh, appropriately perceiving safety considerations. You have to ensure that you have somebody who is watching for safety for each team. You need clear lines of communication to ensure that it's understood how safety issues will be resolved. And our units carry first aid kits. We encourage them to be trained through first aid, stop the bleed. Um, because of the nature of the work being conducted and the risks, we want them prepared to manage whatever may arise. Animal welfare is also a huge consideration when you're dealing with uh, animals in disaster, whether it be domesticated or not. Um, when it comes to exotic animals, you are dealing with a whole additional layer of considerations. And so we look at the ambient risks, but also the fact that we have animals sometimes with very unique um, dietary and husbandry needs and ensuring that we have those supply chains um, up and running if we need to get unique resources through. We have to think about perhaps unique disease considerations and ensuring we have appropriate veterinary uh, consultation um, that the impacted institution is providing. All these different areas have to be thought of but they have to be triaged appropriately because you are dealing with situations at times that are actively deteriorating. And so you do not have the luxury of time. ZDR3 does a lot of things that do um, either directly or indirectly support animal welfare priorities. Um, that's everything from helping identify husbandry needs or providing evacuation support to facility repairs that are directly uh, responsible for animal welfare, like ensuring that there's electrical for reptile collections. Um, in addition to providing direct services, there's also the need to provide appropriate on-scene behavior. So is somebody watching the animal behaviors to ensure that they're not being agitated by what's going on, whether it be chainsaw work or other equipment work? Um, we need to work to ensure 
that their caretaker is responsible for their care and that veterinarians are engaged as appropriate and that it's the impacted institution making the decisions. You have to ensure that they are empowered throughout this whole process because those animals are theirs and their responsibility. And you want to ensure that the veterinary consultations are there as needed throughout an entire operation. So in the last several years, DDR3 has conducted multiple response operations um, to 22 impacted facilities in five states and one territory. Um, most recently, uh, I've had the pleasure of serving Guam. And over the course of the last several years, we've had responders come in from all over the country to provide peer-to-peer -peer support. Those response activities don't just look like coming out with chainsaws, there's different areas that we will cover, including advanced notifications. We work with regulatory agencies as needed when they have areas of concern and they want us to work with a facility. If that facility wants to engage with us, we will. Um, so with 2022 having been as busy in 2023 already ramping up, we are expecting it to be a very busy um, year. So we've had a lot of incidences that we are going to bypass because what I wanted to emphasize to this group is our recent experience in Guam, which for those who are not familiar geographically, it's situated on the exact opposite side of the world from uh, the Eastern coast of the United States. And they recently experienced a typhoon that left their zoo in a hard spot. Um, these folks were prepared to engage in the recovery process, but it was a lot of work and having a situation like a territory that far away made resource provisions and other um, areas that we would normally cover with a team driving in, you had additional challenges in Guam. And I was thinking about how amazing it would have been if I could have been in touch with disaster response coalitions from Australasia, from Japan, like other zoo groups that have come together in the ways EDR3 has. And that would be the vision for the future is we've done this in the United States. How can that expand and how can other countries engage in this coalition building or who already has that we can begin working with um, and better uh, enhance the ability for the facilities that we are also proud to have within our borders. How can we help them better respond and recover to their disasters? So we look forward to being part of the solution and we thank you for your time. And I'm sorry, you're breaking up a little bit, but I saw the question from Kevin Dennison regarding reimbursement. And thank you, Kevin, for the opportunity to clarify that the zoos themselves, they may be eligible for reimbursement and that they oftentimes do pursue that if they are eligible. The challenge we as CDR 3 run into is the pathway toward a zoo getting that reimbursement and involving us as part of the paperwork trail has thus far not been realistic for the facilities that we've been serving because they have not been in a position to document or engage in that process. We would love to better um, understand pathways that we could potentially pursue. But at this point, from the standpoint of our response teams getting reimbursed for their work, we've not found that to be um, accessible.